My uh, next guest, I'm excited. I actually had the liberty to work with him uh, recently on a project uh, with Bjork for, on her new exhibition at MoMA. We were in Iceland together. Um, he's the president of XRES, um, and the, he's basically specializing in image-based 3D technologies as well as computational uh, photography for immersive environments. So they're doing a lot of really cool content for VR. Um, and uh, please welcome Greg Downey. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot. All right, uh, so at X-Ray Studio, we've been working on uh, creating VR in immersive environments. Uh, we've, for in the area of VR, we've been focusing on cinematic VR. So if you're not familiar with cinematic VR, the, the idea is that um, it's kind of an in-between experience. It's got aspects of it that are passive and that you're watching a linear movie, but it's also active because you're looking around at the environment. So it's a guided experience. So I'm going to talk about um, techniques that we use for three different immersive uh, environments that we work on. Uh, for the last five years, we've done a lot of work in uh, Full Dome. We've worked on several IMAX movies. And for the last year, uh, we've done quite a bit of virtual reality. We did our first virtual reality installation in the National Parks in 2006. Um, the, uh, there's some tricks about this. Uh, whenever you're doing this from a 3D asset, uh, rendering for all of these formats is pretty straightforward. Uh, you can simply use a stereoscopic uh, lens shader that renders a complete spherical image. Uh, so that's a known quantity. And out of all of these formats, I'm sure you're already familiar with uh, virtual reality because it's in the press and IMAX because it's in theaters near you. The one you may not be quite as familiar with is full dome format. Uh, so there are several thousand of these theaters around the world. Uh, these theaters uh, can hold up to about 200 people. Uh, they have multiple uh, cinema quality projectors that you can see in this image. They're uh, kind of around the edge. You can see the little little projectors around the edge, and the images stitched together the same way that you might stitch a, uh, a panorama together out of images. They do the same thing with the projections, and that gives you something that's higher resolution than IMAX and uh, more field of view uh, than an IMAX screen. This poses uh, very unique uh, difficulties when you want to shoot live action. Uh, because there is not a, this is typically done at 4K, and there is not a 4K by 4K sensor uh, that you can put a fisheye lens on that you can shoot live action with. Uh, so in order to do that, we've had to develop lots of cheats. Uh, now for full dome, that's occasionally stereoscopic. Uh, VR, uh, generally you want that to be stereoscopic. Uh, so we kind of have this uh, mix of things that we want our content to be. You know, we really want our content to be spherical, uh, stereoscopic, and in motion. Now, motion in stereo is uh, very doable. Uh, you know, this, we've seen this lots of movies in the last couple of years done with this. There's a very mature industry. Uh, this is a, a well-known thing on how to achieve stereoscopic uh, video. Now, spherical stereoscopic images are still a little tricky, but it's, it's doable. Uh, we saw earlier uh, yesterday uh, uh, in Sarah Kenderdine's presentation uh, the Hampy Place project where she did this uh, in, I believe, 2006. Um, so this is something that's doable. And there are also modern uh, uh, digital equivalents to this as well. It's not just film. And spherical motion photography is also possible. Um, this is, uh, we can simply stitch images from multiple cameras together. Um, now this is a uh, Freedom 360 GoPro rig. Uh, there are lots of other rigs made with higher end cameras. You can use mirrors to put them in the, so that the virtual viewpoint is in exactly the same place like Disney did with Circle Vision. There's um, a, a lot of ways that you can do this. So this is also doable. However, if you want all three of these, Right now, that is really, really hard. Um, this is something that uh, is something that everybody wants to do right now. Um, and the rigs that exist right now are, um, are all compromises in that it's not a physically accurate rig, but you're trying to do other things to compensate uh, to create an image that's still compelling and believable, uh, that has good stereo and good motion and is also spherical. 
Now, we'll probably eventually see that problem solved by technologies like light fields. There may be three or four other ways. And I'm sure in the coming years, we'll see lots of solutions on how we can get all of those, uh, all of those working together. But for now, uh, I'll share with you what we're doing. Um, we are taking our spherical and our motion and our stereo. We're not necessarily requiring all of them to intersect at once. But instead, uh, we're using techniques like photogrammetry, uh, the use of depth sensors, uh, scanning and compositing in order to bring all of those elements to our VR. Uh, then we put them into a, a 3D engine, and as I mentioned before, once you get it into a 3D engine, it's fairly simple to render out a movie. Um, so uh, last summer, uh, we got to work on uh, a project with Bjork that's going to open up at the MoMA next, uh, next month. And uh, that should be a very exciting opening. Um, and for this project, we did a lot of photogrammetry. Um, so we did photogrammetry, laser scanning. Uh, we filmed her performance with depth cameras uh, to recreate the environment, to expand the environment. Now, I would love to show you guys uh, this piece but you're gonna have to wait. You're gonna have to wait till next month. Uh, what I can show you is the test that we did um, uh, in order to, as more of a proof of concept. So what you'll see here is a video that uh, I think the guys backstage will start for me. Uh, so this is the concept. Uh, to start by capturing a terrain using photogrammetry, uh, so we had 20-foot poles that we used, and we just walked around this environment and shot them. Once we uh, completed shooting the environment and generated the terrain, uh, we then filmed a Bjork-sized model uh, using the uh, Canon 5D Mark III with the Magic Lantern raw hack so that we could get really high-quality video. And we used a Movi stabilizer and just filmed her walking through the scene. We then tracked uh, that video into the original model. This now allows us to use the model to extend the set. So it extends it beyond the frame. So this is a set extension example. Uh, it can also be 3D. And we can do this for a complete uh, 360 environment. So this is the result that you can see here. Now, you may notice that the, the ground is a little bit lower resolution than the rest of the environment. Uh, that was, that's, there's no technical deficiency there. That is uh, simply done because this was a test proof of concept. So there's one example of how we um, separate the different elements. We still get, get a full stereo solution, a full motion, and complete surround. Okay, so uh, another example uh, where we did this was the uh, Maya 2015 content. So some of you, if you, any of you are Maya users, you probably saw this when uh, Maya came out. Uh, it was used as a uh, backdrop for all of the examples uh, uh, in the tutorial videos uh, about Maya. Now what I'm about to show you um, is the tufas around Mono Lake. So on the right, you can see those tufas are actually very small. They're about two and a half feet tall. And we uh, photographed them, laser scanned them. Um, and we performed photogrammetry on them to create an environment. Now, um, as you'll see in a moment, uh, we also did several uh, small tricks just to uh, make sure that, um, uh, or excuse me, we, we kind of tricked the scene a little bit and tried to make it look like a giant scene. So we'll take you there next. And there should be sound. <laughs>
quite lucky in that piece in that we got a beautiful Sierra wave that we captured. We actually captured this all on site at the same time. So we were shooting HDR uh, hemispheres of the sky as well during the whole day that we captured and we got extremely lucky uh, with that beautiful cloud formation at the end. Now uh, this is a flat presentation of this. Uh, of course if you grab me afterwards um, I'll be happy to show you uh, the spherical view uh, in the gear. Now uh, another project that we've done a bit of work on is uh, we've done some work on Easter Island. Um, we did this with the Easter Island statue project and worked with uh, Joanne Van Tilburg, who's been working on the island since the, since the 1980s. Uh, we did quite a bit of photogrammetry. Uh, this was photogrammetry of a first time dig of uh, one of the Moai statues. Uh, this was a, a very exciting project to work on. Um, there was a pretty significant discovery in that the uh, only there are out of the 4,000 moai that are on the island, there is only one on the whole island that has a round head uh, up until we finished this dig in which we found uh, the second round-headed moai. So it's believed that the round heads came before uh, the stylized square-headed uh, moai. So we found what might, could possibly be the oldest uh, uh, statue on the island uh, at the base of this one uh, during the excavation. Uh, and now we've got it uh, fully textured uh, from the photogrammetry. Uh, so I was invited out by the archaeologist because she really wanted these uh, models. Um, I came out because I was really interested in bringing this world uh, into VR. So we did very thorough and complete captures. Uh, we did photogrammetry of every single statue on the inside of Rano Raraku, which is the volcano that all of the Moai were mined out of. Um, this is the what was previously thought to be the oldest Moai. Um, this Moai is the only other round-headed Moai on the island. And uh, we were able to uh, actually solve some long-standing disputes about whether or not the Moai had carved out pupils. Uh, it's hard to see with the texture, but as soon as we remove the texture, uh, you can see that there are round pupils in the center of each eye. If you guys don't mind hitting play on that one more time, just in case people missed it, because it's a subtle detail. So when I was photographing this statue, uh, I was working probably six inches away from his face and I could not really tell if the pupils had been carved. It was only by removing the texture afterwards that that became really clear. Now, uh, the last thing that um, I'd love to show you, uh, but I can't, is uh, the VR Traveler, which is our uh, new VR experience. It's essentially a, um, uh, a teaser trailer for all of it. We've got, we've, for each of the pieces that you see in that teaser, uh, we're going to have a 7 to 12 minute uh, VR piece that we're hoping to sell uh, in app stores. Um, you can come out. I'll be, just grab me anywhere uh, around the show for the rest of the day. I'll be walking around with the VR headset over there. Uh, also, my business partner, Eric Hansen, who's probably somewhere in the audience. Eric, he's right back there. Um, he'll also have a headset. He'd be happy to show you as well. All right, thanks. <laughs>